care where you go, each, each neighborhood's got its own problems and they're gonna have them. And if people don't get together and try to stop it, it's gonna keep having them. In the 20s and the 30s, this, just this area right here in the Idor neighborhood was called the Millionaire's Playground. The city was just booming. The crime and the violence and drug traffic and so forth in, in this area was a major problem. That kind of thing can go on, you know, that you can't be safe walking in your neighborhood. You know. We've got to get that back in check. Well, so there's definitely been some improvement, but there's room for much more improvement. But a lot of other cities are looking towards Youngstown and trying to figure out how it works. To my knowledge, there's not been a neighborhood in this city, in the state, in the country where almost every parcel of vacant land has been put back to some kind of use. This is the story of one neighborhood's transformation from gray to green, division to unity, and blight to beauty. Welcome to the Idora Neighborhood. In 2008, project team featuring members of the City of Youngstown, Youngstown State University, The Ohio State University, and Youngstown 2010 was created to help a growing grassroots movement of residents in the Idora neighborhood of Youngstown South Side. They developed a strategy and a document called the Idora Neighborhood Comprehensive Plan as a framework for revitalizing a community of rich history, large estate homes, and beautiful views of Mill Creek Park one of the largest urban park systems in the United States. Youngstown is located in Northeast Ohio. The region is conveniently located within short travel of many major U.S. cities. Youngstown has historically been an industrial powerhouse known for its steel production, second only to Pittsburgh in terms of total steel production in the United States at one time. Youngstown produced close to 20% of the nation's finished steel for the war effort. During World War I, Youngstown's population grew so rapidly that there was not enough housing. The city continued to thrive through World War II to the early 70s. We've got 20 years with the company. It's been a good 20 years with the company, but now it's out of a job. When the steel mills went down, they could not believe that they wouldn't come back. They just, they were in total denial. You just don't know how to swallow it. It's, uh, you hear all the rumors coming around and you still can't believe it. And now that it's here, they shove it down your throat. You just, it's hard to accept. They're asking to turn Youngstown into a ghost town. Basically, it fell to the valley to solve its own problems, the problems caused by the now quiet furnaces at Sheeton 2. There was a lot of bitterness, you know, because they felt they really got sold down the river. I think the things just uh, started deteriorating. The city of Youngstown has gone from, I believe, 180,000 people down to about 78,000. But industrial decline is not unique to Youngstown. Cities like Detroit, Cleveland, and Buffalo have struggled to reinvent themselves, just as the Idora neighborhood will have to do. Despite this transformation, Youngstown still has much to offer, a vibrant state university that continues to grow, an internationally recognized art museum, beautiful architecture, and a blossoming art, theater, and music community. Next 30 minutes, danceable, listening to all sorts of music coming your way from Ohio's million dollar playground, Idora Park. Opening on May 30th, 1899, Idora Park was built by a streetcar company. It was the center of recreation for the city years ago. People came from all over to Idora Park. I, mean, I remember we made many trips to Idora Park as a kid and even when I was an adult. Idora Park was a very important to a South Sider and to the area in general. That's where we used to have our church picnics. 
It was glorious, listening to the great famous bands that would come through. To do a lot of polka dances over there. I would still go up to the park to buy those famous french fries. That was a kind of a special place. I loved that park. That was a great park. Idora Park remained successful until the late 1970s, when the city's economic downturn was begun by the closing of the steel mills. Decline of the park continued until 1984. The call came in just after the noon hour at Idora Park, and within minutes, the smoke could be seen all over the valley. 50% of the amusement park was in flames, and it's been speculated welding at the point where the Lost River Ride and the famous Wildcat come together sparked the blaze. The park operated through the summer, but with its premier ride gone, a decision was made to close for good on September 16, 1984. It's a shame to see it go. Do you like Idora Park? Are you going to miss it? I've seen a lot of people cry today, but you know. We've left people with a lot of memories, and that's important. In 1985, the remains of Idora Park were purchased by Mount Cavalry Pentecostal Church, who announced plans to build a religious complex called the City of God. Even though the fire destroyed much of the park, the ballroom remained open for many special events until 1986. Over the next few years, Mount Calvary failed to create the City of God, and the abandoned, unsecured property was left open to the elements. It suffered from decay and was heavily vandalized. Smoke was reported in the Idora Park era at about 9.50 this morning. By the time crews found the flames, it was too late. Perhaps the only monument to that memory that would remain burnt to the ground this morning, and that was, of course, the beautiful ballroom. Onlookers of all ages watched the ballroom fall, realizing another part of Youngstown history is gone forever. Where shall we go from here? What's going to happen? I mean, will there be something else to replace the Nidora Park? Or will that ever happen again in our lifetime? On March 5th, 2001, the historic Idora Ballroom burned down, closing the final chapter on Idora Park's history. At, at one time, you know, professional type people lived in this neighborhood. This area of town really was like Boardman is now, you know. It was it was a very ritzy part, and I mean, just, you know, when you travel down Volney Avenue, you know, you can, you can really tell some of the, the beautiful, beautiful homes. I mean, some people have left the neighborhood. That's why you see all these vacant houses. But they've run into the same problems going to Austin Town or Boardman, and same thing. But the Idora neighborhood has much to offer. From its diverse and beautiful housing, its location on the doorstep of Mill Creek Park, and close proximity to downtown Youngstown and Youngstown State University. This location, assets, and incredible history has positioned Idora for positive change. But the neighborhood has many challenges ahead. The Glenwood Avenue Commercial Corridor is merely a shadow of its former self. It is no longer a bustling shopping district of stores and nightclubs, but a wasteland of vacant lots and structures. The corridor also lacks many of the facilities necessary to meet the daily needs of residents. The neighborhood has been declared a food desert, since there is no grocery stores or markets within miles to purchase fresh food. Only corner stores that sell mainly junk food, cigarettes, beer, and alcohol. The Idor neighborhood consists of 750 homes. Approximately right now, there's over 200 of them vacant. Those magnificent homes that were built by the steel magnets my God, they, they can't be replaced today. A lot of old houses, a lot of nice homes, just let go. If these homes were transplanted to Washington, D.C., they would be million dollar homes. You got abandoned houses, houses with siding tore off the side of them. But as you know, you've traveled around here, you can see how these houses look and how some of the neighborhoods look. And some people just say, what the heck? They don't, you know, don't nobody care, you know? There's a tree growing right here on the balcony. I mean, how long has this spot been vacant? A very long time for a tree to start growing up through the roof. Some of these houses really need to be tore, tore down because you got the crackheads going in there, you got homeless just going in there staying. And I mean, look at this house. You got kids running around here all day. A kid can go up in here and get hurt. Then once you have them empty houses, it becomes a rat hole. Rats are in there. Sometimes dogs will be going in there. And the dogs get vicious in a pack sometimes. 
and they're roaming in and out. And when they find out ain't nobody living in there, they come in there and they try to take the pipes out and whatever they can take. Next door, um, they stole the plumbing, they stole like, the leaded windows, they even stole the front door. As soon as someone vacate a house, and if it's aluminum on it, they rip them off. They come at night, some got enough balls to come do it in the daytime. And I've seen them ripping them off the house, and the police is riding right by, and the guy ripping them off right, there, right off the house. They don't stop and say nothing. So a lot of what was proper in Youngstown has moved out to the suburbs. Let's get away from here, you know. Suburbs have gotten bigger and more commodious and more populated. I mean, there are people that, that do work here and are paying taxes. Where is that money going? I mean, you can go, you can ride out to Boardman and immediately see the difference. You know, what is the city doing in terms of enforcement? Something's not happening. And when you come in here, you immediately know you're back in Youngstown. I mean, I know there's a lot of property owners here that live in, in Florida and, you know, out of state. There were a lot of landlords that took advantage of that and, and bought up properties and then rented them to just anybody. And generally, if you go by and the properties run down, you can almost bet it's tenants that are living there. So, you know, the landlords have to take some responsibility for the neighborhoods as well. They're public nuisances. The reason why crime is increasing because nobody has any jobs. I've seen a decline in the neighborhoods. If there's jobs or some type of uh, outlet where people can make money at, you know what I'm saying, the, the crime rate would probably go down. All the houses on Ingle Nook had been robbed. And it's a dilemma that almost everybody that owns property here faces. You, you, we started to be afraid. Our children were afraid for us. And they're afraid to come out of their house. They're afraid to do anything in their yard. Oh, Mom and Dad, you know, don't you want to move? I was in disbelief. Like, you're telling me that 12 to 14, 15 year old kids are carrying guns and they're threatening you not to come out of your house, that you better stay in. Some of them can't even sit on their porch with you know, some of these clowns running around, you're acting stupid, you know what I mean? And that's what uh, a lot of senior citizens are afraid of. If we wish to walk up to the dollar store, it was just robbed two days ago. It's been robbed now three times. The loitering, the shooting, we've had murders, we've had petty theft, we've had carjackings. There were, there were gang problems and turf wars. My alarm went off for two hours before the policeman come. It wasn't no big thing, because I was still sitting in the house. I came to the house, you know, when it went off, because my neighbor called me, you know. When the policeman came, I said, how long it took you so long to get it? The alarm went off. He said, we know, it, but we had a couple other things to do, you know. So you know what I told him? I said, well, the guy's in the back. He said, what do you mean? I said, I caught him, he's back there. I said, go, he said, what? I said, he's laying back there. I said, I caught him. Then after a while, he was going back, I said, no, man, he ain't, ain't nobody back there. <laughs> How I ended up Youngstown, I lived in a little town called Majory, Ohio. I was tired of a small house. I wanted a bigger house, and I wanted an old money mansion is what I wanted. Something I could have, fix up. I went to the realtor, which was mainly realty, and I said, hey, I'm looking for an old house, affordable. And he said, I know, I know where the place is, but you don't want to move there. The realtor steered me away. He said, don't come here. He said, in five years, this will be nothing. You'd never get your investment back. He tried everything to deter me from moving to this community. And I said, you know, I'll take a chance. And I come out here in the Volney Road in, in I do our neighborhood. And it was like awesome. I'm like, these houses are forty, fifty thousand dollars They're 3,000, 4,000 square foot. And it was Jim London who moved into a beautiful home. And he wanted to keep it that way. After one year of being here, I was one of those people that got broke into. And the perpetrators sat on my back, pat in my sun porch in the back, smoked two cigarettes while we slept up in our room. And I thought, wow, it only took you know, less than a year for me to get initiated to the great city of Youngstown. Uh, but I didn't let that discourage me. That led me even more to want to help in this community. Jim and I had met at the first planning meeting. He, you know, he stood up with his with his big yellow t-shirt and his McGruff crime dog uh, block watch pamphlet and he goes, I want to start a block watch. <laughs> and uh, 
everyone just kind of looked at him and I'm thinking, well, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> and Jim is an old ex-biker, you know. Uh, you know exactly where you stand with Jim. After I got here and started to do things with the residents, I started hearing their cries. His size, it might be by intimidation that people cooperate. I am not going to let these community members down by letting a bunch of thugs or people that just don't have no respect for their seniors, children, their self in our community. I thought something needed done about that. He doesn't pull any punches. He's, he's pretty straightforward. And, and he has a good knack for getting things done. And I think he's been spearheading a lot of the improvements in this area. He took charge. I, I love living here. I love it. I'm in the park. This is a fantastic historical parkside community, and I'm not going to let somebody just tear it up. He is willing to do whatever. I think if, if you know Jim's story, you begin to understand, you know, why, why he is committed in such a way that, that he is. I was a uh, drug dealer, like drug cartel. I was bringing 150 pounds of reefer in out of Mexico into Tucson, bringing it, flooding it into a little area. It was all about the money, and I didn't care about the community. I was a menace to society, and it took me prison. Uh, I learned a lot there, and uh, I come to realize that I, I hurt a lot of people. He's, he's got a heart of gold, and uh, you know I really know that he, he, he wants and means the best for the area. People depend on you to do the right thing. That's what you should do. Exactly. He asks for help. He tries to get everybody involved. He's diplomatic. He's got new vinyl stickers for the neighborhood block watch sign, so instead of having the intruder, it's going to say, you know, welcome the Adore Neighborhood Association. He's got a number of grants for the neighborhood. You can't, you can't just sit back and pray for change. You have to get out here and make change happen. I love this. I love where we are. I love the memories we have, you know, everything. And I know that it can change. It can be better. I mean, there's people that's lived here for 40 to 50 years or more that has tried to do things but just give up hope because the city has promised so many things to the to the to the citizens and never followed through with any of it they got to fight to get their roads taken care of like potholes filled they got to fight for snow removal they got to fight for the grass to be cut you can't pray for somebody to uh, improve this yard or you can't pray for this grass to get cut you got to get out here and cut it people want to be needed people want to help but a lot of people don't know how it's time, you know, somebody does something instead of just talking about it or praying about it. You got to get involved. They just didn't know how to how to come about putting a block watch together, our community organization. And I said, well, you know what? We'll start a block watch. Come to the community with a uh, with a community pack to to make sure everybody has the information. What it does, it unifies a collective common sense. More people doing the same objective is better than one person trying to get it done. And they come together and have a cohesive plan, it'll work. I believe it was in November. We're going to have our first meeting. I was very surprised to have probably 40 to 50, maybe 60 people at that meeting. That sense of being neighbors is something that's growing. And it just kept growing and growing. It grew into a great, great organization which we've taken further than any block watch has taken in Youngstown. As part of the Youngstown 2010 plan, we decided we wanted to focus on six different neighborhoods and the Idora neighborhood was one of those six. The reason we chose Idora neighborhood was because we found out quickly that there's a large organization which is very active. Initially, we went door to door uh, asking people to come, talking to them. We did extensive surveys. Uh, the first meeting we probably had 65, 70 people, and this is just from that neighborhood. And then the second meeting we had even more people than that, and they really came up with like the goals that we have there. Those aren't things that we came up with. It was, here's the top issues we're hearing from the neighbors. The appearance of the neighborhood, fixing up the properties, maintaining the cleansiness of the neighborhood. The neighborhood does not get that much police patrol. We have learned to be more aware. Neighborhood, we look out for each other. You know, if I'm gone out of town, they look for, out my, even though I have a burglar alarm, but they watch my house. 
So I think in terms of uniqueness of the people, it's really that they've got themselves together uh, in kind of an organized way and, and have been able to sustain that. I mean, we're going on three years now. People don't have no snow blowers, you get this snow. Got a lawnmower and a weed eater. Basically just started taking care of some of the properties that were not being taken care of. That doesn't happen a lot in a lot of neighborhoods. A lot of times you don't even know your neighbors. If everybody in the neighborhood would work together like that, it would be an improvement for all neighborhoods, not just this one. In a place like Youngstown, resources are often few and far between, so you have to think about prioritizing your development, which, which politically you know, can be challenging. The block watch has determined a lot of crime, but you got to work at it, you know what I mean? You just can't say, I'm on the block watch. We did a statistics in four years and showed how many crimes were committed at these corner stores, around these corner stores, and it was overwhelming. It's, it's not about them selling the liquor. They let a lot of people hang around there. The other problems that come along with it and the type of people that you attract. Drinking outside. Throwing their bottles and cans everywhere. Selling liquor to the underage kids too. Asking for money or antagonizing you as you come by. We can't walk from here up to Glenwood for fear of running into people that might not like us. Causing confusion, they were smoking the dope, selling it. I would fear for my safety to go into these stores, these kind of people hanging around the corners. It's scary. If the corner stores is a magnet bringing these criminals in, then put some sting operation in and look at the corner stores, because that's where our problem is. I don't have a problem with anyone uh, maintaining uh, being in business, but I think they have to take into consideration the appearance of their business. We asked the corner stores to come into a meeting with us and we wanted to express our, our concerns and problems with them to see what we could do as a community to come together. That process led into one corner store owner coming to our meeting. Because everybody else thought it was a joke. We, as a group, as the Idor Neighborhood Association Block Watch, submitted certified letters to every city official. We held a meeting and opened it to the public and the media. All the officials showed up at this meeting except one. We had them commit to cleaning this up, coming up and inspecting every store, every commercial property on our corridor in Glenwood. Inside the city, Youngstown's health commissioner has been doing more store inspections in one neighborhood recently. Dan Martin tells us what he's looking for. As complaints from Councilwoman Annie Gillum and members of the Idora Neighborhood Association grew louder and more frequent, the city health district decided to step up inspections of corner stores, specifically ones that cook and sell food. Dirty floors, dirty walls, uh, they weren't real sure about the quality of the food that was being made. Altman says they typically inspect these stores twice a year, but the complaints have caused them to drop in more often. In 30 days, the buildings were painted, the buildings were addressed as far as any structural or any food, grease, lighting, signage. All them issues was, was addressed by most of the corner stores right away. Unfortunately, many complaints deal with suspected illegal activity going on outside the stores, where the health department has no jurisdiction. The prostitution, uh, drug selling, loitering, things like that. There was one store that just did not want to compromise, and that was Party Pantry. Some of the family members were involved in things that were of the, of the criminal type. What we did is we started a dry precinct campaign. Not to close the store, but to take away liquor, which is probably the lion's share of their business, which got even more kind of confrontational on the stores end. One of the leaders, Frank Elling, who was involved, uh, someone threw pieces of concrete through 15 of his windows because he had a vote no sign up. 80% of the community voted no. Party pantry only lasted approximately two weeks after that. It sends a very strong message that you know, don't come here and do the bullshit. Their son was mad, somebody heckled him across the street. He went over, knocked the guy down, held him at gunpoint. So that's the people that I was dealing with and the community was been dealing with for years. The neighborhood got tired of it, so they put a stop to it. It really, I think it gave people a sense that they could actually do something about it. The individuals that own Party Pantry are expelled out of the state of Ohio and they can't live here for two years because of the crime that their son committed and a shooting incident that happened out the drive through window. I think it's headed in a better direction now. I believe things are really turning around. 
I think there's more pride in the neighborhood. We noticed that a lot of things were getting done in our community then. Our grass was getting cut. Our streets were getting patrolled. Good things were coming about. As the uh, Director of Community Development and Planning for the city, I've been able to focus some of the resources for uh, demolition and for owner-occupied housing rehab. The 2010 concept, which is taking the city uh, that it was suited for a, a population of 250,000. And now, here we sit with 80,000 people and a lot of vacant properties, a lot of vacant houses. Because it's not like we're just holding a neighborhood cleanup. I mean, we're talking about taking down 50 houses, putting back to reuse 100 vacant lots. You know, we're talking about rehabbing 10 houses. We go through these houses now and we see the craftsmanship and the woodwork. Some of these houses are still good houses, you know what I mean? Somebody could actually put some money into these houses. You know, if you can bring a little bit, little bit of that back, that'd be great. There are actually a family from Washington State that's moved in and they have purchased two of the major bigger homes in our in our community. And with that, they have revitalized and they've saved those homes. The, those homes would have been torn down. The homes that are being destroyed now, they are homes that don't have much value now because they've been inherited by people stealing the plumbing fixtures and the, and the copper pipes. If they're beyond repair, sure. They need to be torn down. Out of the total homes that are there that meet the definition of abandonment, I believe there were 28 of them that we had identified. We've torn down to date 20 of those. About eight to do. You know, the problem houses, you know, they should go. All the rodents and the bad people will not be going in and out of the house, and it's making the neighborhood look a lot better. It's kind of stemmed from a question that I was asked by a reporter. Has any neighborhood seen a change? You know, have we made a difference under the Youngstown 2010 plan? And I really had a hard time answering that question because, you know, we've made a big difference in downtown and we've made a big difference in some of the industrial parks with the industrial development and attracting businesses in and, of course, Youngstown State University. I hadn't been able to answer that question as it relates to a neighborhood. What can we do? What should we do? What do we want to do? It doesn't look natural for you know what we what we leave behind after uh, the home is demolished. You know, just this vacant lot that you know the weeds are growing up over it. Um, but to actually treat that lot as if it belongs to somebody, um, even if it's you know just to seed it and, and maintain it, um, really will help the neighborhood out and, and help increase property values. This site in particular used to be a very dilapidated, bombed out kind of sixplex apartment building that was torn down about a year and a half ago. And this was just kind of a debris strewn vacant lot and now you can see how it looks now. It's full of vibrant and fully blooming uh, plants. It's pretty nice to see green stuff growing instead. This is the Parkview Avenue Community Garden. When you ride by, it's pretty. This is the first functional community garden in the Idora neighborhood. It looks fruitful. It looks different. It's part of the Lots of Green project, which is a vacant land reuse project. Just seeing the, this issue and seeing the opportunity that there is to have the gardens and things like that within the neighborhoods is pretty amazing. I've been very interested to see how things are going and to see how much things have changed since I got here less than three months ago. We used to all get together maybe when Idora was going, we'd see each other then, but this is way, way, way better. You know, before the gardens were here, they hadn't come here out here and met their neighbors, even if they'd been living here 10, 11 years, and that this is the first time they've really been out, which is great. You almost guarantee to find somebody out here working that you can chat with and garden with. And everyone who's been in the garden seems to love it. The lettuce is very good. Nothing like your own grown stuff than the store-bought stuff. It has a whole different taste, whole different texture. It was just something like I've never tasted. It was delicious. Did you plant all these by yourself? No. <laughs> Who planted this? Mommy. You know, the nutritional aspect of growing fresh produce, um, that's really lacking as far as groceries in the neighborhood. That's part of it. It makes it look better than just the empty slot of space. Like just empty land. But the big thing I think is the, the sense of community. 
It looks like a community. When you drive through the neighborhood in a year, a year and a half, you can say, you know, man, man, something's happened on Parkview Avenue, you know, Mineral Springs has changed. The, the 10 homes are gone and, you know, someone's working there, man in a garden now that's feeding 50 people that live there. It has taken several years, commitment, and plenty of sweat equity to transform the Idora neighborhood on Youngstown's south side into a community in the truest sense of the word. Other parts of the, uh, the city and other sides, the north side, east side, west side, they're following suit with what we did. The group grew from two people to more than 250, and working with the city of Youngstown, pushed to demolish 40 vacant homes, rehab five others, and reclaim 120 lots. Really doing something that not only shows results, but is a story, not just, not just for Adora, but for Youngstown, for, for all the people here. Very slowly, bit by bit, we're, we're coming full circle to the to, to be in the kind of neighbors that, you know, I grew up with back in the 50s and 60s, you know. Yeah, I actually know their name, you know, can shake their hand. I like to see it be a nice, quiet neighborhood where you can raise your family. And... It's definitely, you know, cre creating a better atmosphere here. There are other prospects on the horizon. You don't have to worry about crime. Maybe they can get some back, some little, you know, shops. Right here, where the old Cleveland school used to be, a North Carolina developer is considering putting a 17,000 square foot grocery store here, something this neighborhood hasn't seen for years. You don't have to worry about picking up trash every morning in front of your house or your business. This is all part of the big picture. There's those little, you know, smoldering sparks of hope here and there that that can can uh, can be fanned back to life with the right you know you know influence and and encouragement and that's what i want to see in this area now the city says the signs of change are all around this historic area no longer identified by blight and crime but a model of change for others I, I'm a total outsider in this community, and I was accepted, and people come through this community with myself, Ian, and other members we have, and thank you so much for putting hope back into our community. Community members came out on Saturday to help paint a mural on the formal Sparkle Market Building located on Glenwood Avenue on the city's south side. The mural project will transform the vacant building into a vibrant display of public art. Organizers say this is the largest mural ever painted by a community here in the city of Youngstown. I'm James Lennon, I'm the mirror. president of the Idor Neighborhood Association, the Idor Neighborhood Block Watch Captain, and the Idor Wildcats 4-H Advisor. Three years ago, we weren't looking like this. We were fighting against the owner that owns this building, fighting against these corner stores. Here we are three years later, it's kind of like we've gone through the full cycle. You know, we had nature, the trees were cut down, the land was developed, there was a house there. Now that in that particular area, we're going back to where we began. So bring Youngstown back to where it used to be.